Good morning. Good morning. Welcome you to worship this morning, whether you are here with us in the sanctuary or watching our service later on at home. And I'd especially like to welcome a couple of new visitors this morning. We're, so, we're glad that you're here. Of a few announcements this morning, um, in the past month, severe weather swept across upper New York and many local communities were affected. Our two denominations continue to provide relief in several forms, including in-person teams, grants, food, and clothing, and emergency financial assistance. Today we'll take a special offering for the Upper New York storm relief efforts happening in both the Methodist Conference and the Presbytery. All loose, I'm gonna change this, it says all loose offerings will be divided. However, uh, in order to eliminate any confusion, there is a separate basket in the narthex for donations to, for that relief fund or funds. So um, just, just be aware that there is a separate basket out there for that. And it will be divided between the two denominations, uh, the total that is received. Uh, we'll be holding a new member class this fall. And if you are interested or curious about joining our congregation, please let either Diane Schaefer or Joan O'Donnell know, either in person, by email, or by calling the church. Once we have an idea of who will be involved, we will gather for an introductory meeting in September. Just to let you know, the air conditioning unit in the fellowship hall, finally, the part came in after two months. It has been repaired, and we have been told that it's, that unit is not meant to be turned on and off. We should leave it on all the time at a setting that, you know, if we're not gonna be down there, it doesn't need to be real cool. But just so everybody's aware of that, don't be turning it on and off. You can turn the setting if it's set kind of warm, and we're gonna be down there, you can change the setting, but please don't turn it off. Thank you. Please. <coughs> I will now light our candle of remembrance and the candle of peace. Remembrance is lit for those in the military, their families, veterans, first responders, and all those in harm's way. While the candle of peace reminds us to pray for God's peace in our homes, community, nation, and the world. Now, if you would please rise, if you are able, and join me at our call to worship, taken from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Great are the works of the Lord. Study all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty in his work. Our first hymn this morning is number 2143, I Got Peace Like a River.
be seated. Please join me in our prayer of unison as printed in the bulletin and on the screen. Lord, we confess our ignorance as we turn away from wisdom for your will from others, from our best selves. Forgive us, we pray, as we promise to do better. And now the words of assurance. Lord, as we gather this morning, let us praise you with everything we have. Let us remember you are always with us, whether we notice you or not, as we follow your righteousness from our waking to our sleeping. And now in celebration of that gathering and looking to praise God, let us pass the peace with our neighbors. Our first reading this morning is a wisdom reading from Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has earned her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has set out her servant girls sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat my bread and drink the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the sight. I'm sorry. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. This is the word of God for the people of God. This is the word of God within us. And this is the word of God in scripture. Our next hymn this morning is number 2034, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord.
You may be seated. Hopefully that got your blood pumping. If nothing else for the uh, stress of, am I singing the right part here? <laughs> um, that is one of the many times I've introduced a song that, so usually when I have a song there that I'm not familiar with and that we're not familiar with, it's because of two reasons. One, that it um, tied into the scripture for the day, and this is from a later section of Proverbs, so there you go. And two, that I listened to it on YouTube and thought we could tackle it, thought it was simple enough to, to do that. So um, I think we passed with flying colors both ways, and uh, maybe we'll uh, do a little bit more of that in the future. But uh, the feedback I got at our last board meeting here was we need to be, um, get the blood pumping at the beginning of the service so you don't sleep through the sermon. Um, so I can't guarantee you'll still won't sleep through the sermon, but at least I, I did my piece. Um, Actually, what's funny is some people take it as a compliment if you do, because that means you're so at ease and at peace. That, uh, <laughs> like, if I'm preaching about social justice and we need to help the world, I don't want you sleeping through it. But if I'm preaching, like, relaxing in community, then, okay, why not? Um, just, just don't be mad if I use you as an example. <laughs> So-and-so sleeping. Um, good morning. What a wonderful day it is to be here in the house of the Lord. We've got, what, two more Sundays until communion again? Isn't that weird? Didn't August just fly by? Yes. Yeah, I keep, I keep uh, seeing September dates and going, oh, man, I can kick that can down the road. Wait a minute. Um, so it's, uh, it's very exciting with that, coming back to school, as, as you've seen with the gathering, with the, um, with the uh, mission stuff. So that's, that's, it's all exciting stuff, but it's just very fast. Um, it also hasn't really felt like a normal summer in this part of the country until the last two weeks, I think. It hasn't been like boiling until the last two. It's been boiling up to the last two weeks. Um, yeah, a couple weeks ago, I was having lunch with... Um, Reverend Brian Copeland, who is in this Presbyterian, who also does a yoked ministry on Sunday mornings. And he's from South Carolina. He's from South Carolina, I'm from East Tennessee. And we were both like, yeah, it's been pretty hot here the last few weeks. Because <laughs> that's, that's the key, right? That, um, that uh, down south, um, and I still can't believe this is the case, because um, I, I was used to growing up in my southern church um, with a pastor who was able to wear a robe year round because that's how good the air conditioning was. So even when it's 110 down south, they can still wear a robe and not sweat too much. We don't have that luxury up here. Um, so that's the difference, is that it doesn't get as hot up here, but there's less air conditioning, and, and buildings are meant to insulate during the winter, not the summer. So, um, All right, now that I'm done kvetching about that, uh, today is, um, I always like to try to, put in whatever today is, partly because you guys gave me a calendar in my office that tells me exactly that, um, and partly because as people who have been here, heard even two sermons of mine would know, I do like to preach the headlines, um, which is what I was taught in seminary. Uh, so today is what's known as Young Adult Volunteer Commissioning Sunday, the YAVs. It's one of the many ministries our denomination supports. Methodists have that too. I'm Presbyterian, but uh, Methodists in every denomination has that as well. Some version of you going with a denom doesn't have to be your own, going with your denomination for a year um, to serve in a place. Um, so sometimes you can serve in Indianapolis, you can serve in uh, California and things like that. And then I have some friends who, um, did New Orleans. I think one of my colleagues in seminary did two years of this, one in um, New Orleans and then one in Northern Ireland. Um, what a contrast. But yeah, you know, lots of partying and food both ways, I guess. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, but I was actually close to the New York City ones because they would hang out with those of us who were on the Columbia University campus like me. Um, so I, I, I haven't done this program myself, but I'm very glad our denomination has this and that we have people who, who can do that and be exposed to the larger uh, work that our church is doing. Um, by the way, the, the New York City and the DC and Washington DC stuff, the Presbyterian and Methodist churches actually have offices at the UN and on Capitol Hill. So people can go intern with those, we can do missions with those, things like that. So. I'll mention that for no particular reason, not because we have a missions committee, not because they're very close, you know, I can't see us ever uh, thinking of that. 
Um, but today, this morning, I wanted to focus on Proverbs because it's shorter and more meaningful. Initially, we were going to do that and a verse from 1 Kings, which wasn't terribly long, but was a story about uh, young uh, King Solomon, David's successor in Israel, gaining wisdom. Um, but he's also, uh, so he's known as Solomon the Wise, as many of you know. Um, but Proverbs is also his writing, and honestly, um, I just wanted more time for the sermon instead of, uh, instead of reading a longer passage. So what time we could have taken from that, now we get five more minutes for the sermon. Isn't that great? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, Proverbs, but I like short and sweet passages. Oddly enough, those end up with the longest sermons. So here we go. Um, now, I will admit, I feel somewhat uncomfortable talking about this notion of wisdom as someone who is younger than the majority of this congregation, and most congregations, um, there's a th because there's a thin line for us pastors between spiritual counseling and pretending we think we know more about your lives than we do, right? There's, there's an authority there, but it's not an authority that says, I know better than you, because um, the older I get, the less I like the term you know me better than I know myself, the less I uh, really buy into that. Um, the other thing I'll say, sorry, one last announcement is that um, we'll be having our worship committee meeting here at 1130 uh, next week right after the service. So if you're a part of that, come to that. But also, if you have anything that you would like us to address, and especially any hymns that you guys like or are familiar with or remember singing, that would be helpful so I can put more of those in the bulletin so we're not singing um, stuff that you're unfamiliar with all the time. So you can get a little bit of a comfort zone, a little bit of a broadening of horizons at the same time. So please let Darlene know about that. Or me, of course. Now, we know our experience will always guide us, including singing those hymns. That our perspectives are valid and that we can stand in that confidence saying, I am a scholar of my own experience. The world can never take that experience and wisdom away from us. And yet the world is constantly giving us those living experiences that will help us become wiser. It's always giving us the opportunity to choose wisdom, as our Proverbs passage discusses. This particular passage comes at the end of a nine chapters long section and introduction that personifies wisdom as a woman in both character and pronouns. So the the Hebrew refers to wisdom as a she, and then there's also this figure called Lady Wisdom. And so for the sake of this, of illustrating this, it creates these two characters named Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly, just both personified in women that host uh, people in, uh, for feasts in their house. So even though we're talking about this concept of wisdom, there's also a character named Wisdom who's the personification of that and one named Folly. So that's confusing. And for the sake of um, remembrance, I'll call the characters W and F. Then we'll go back to the concept of wisdom. So that way we can kind of just program ourselves to distinguish from that. Now it's worth mentioning that Proverbs is dictated from a father to a son, kind of like the princess bride. It doesn't necessarily mean God and Jesus, God's the father and Jesus is the son, but it's just a regular old father and son. Since the son is supposed to be smart, or he's aiming to be smart, let's call him Albert, after Einstein, a famous and eccentrically, socially eccentric scientist. It's also worth noting that W and F are written by men. So for that reason, I really don't like this contrast between lady folly and lady wisdom. Playing two women against each other while also pretending there isn't wisdom and simplicity. For me, reading this passage felt like seeing The Wizard of Oz after, Wic after seeing Wicked. I'm supposed to cheer for the good guys, but instead I just feel bad for the bad guys. So keeping that in mind, let's go through this passage quickly. In verse 1, W builds a house herself, meant to be a strong foundation and another symbol of why Albert should pick her over F. She also puts up her seven pillars, which is important because seven in Hebrews means wholeness. W wants to make Albert whole, whereas F wants to keep Albert from attempt achieving his potential. In verse 2, W prepares her animals, mixes her wine, and sets the table for the meal. This made me think of first serving with Column our last Sunday afternoon at Brown Memorial, Methodist Church downtown. 
which a few of us did, including, um, including uh, Darlene and Chuck from here, and Anne as well. We were preparing food like hot dogs and sliced watermelon for our guests without housing, and because we wanted them to feel safe and taken care of with the plating, not just asking them to do their own plating or anything else, but like we were giving them something that was pre-made, like it was a restaurant experience, not just, here you go, get it from the slop trough, but no, we're taking care of you. We're loving you. And we ate that food as well, which increased the community even more, knowing nobody was looking down on the food that we had made. W is setting a table with these same rules, where all are welcome. And then in verse 4, W climbs the highest place, both closest to God and easiest to shout. So think about someone climbing on top of um, this spiral, or the highest uh, building in downtown Syracuse, and yelling, you who are simple, turn in here, calling for people to join her. And then the second half of verse 4 talks about those without sense, which could be referring to those who are simple, but could also be referring to those who are so smart they kind of forget the big picture, and they don't want to eat with the common folk. So in verse 5 and 6, W invites all these unwise people to come in, to break bread, to leave their naivete, and continue to live and walk towards understanding and clarity. So prepare a meal, yell at everyone, and they'll show up. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, as all of us who have been kids, or maybe even those of us who have had kids, know it's not that simple. You can tell someone dinner's ready, but that doesn't mean they'll instantly come down to eat with you if they're busy. Sometimes you got to yell at the kids over and over and over again, dinner's ready, which is hilarious because that's when you need food the soonest the most when you're at that age. So, Now that I have outlined this passage, I have to admit, appealing to the simple slash naive folk is a weirdly condescending way to talk about people of the village, even in a metaphor. Because we're all both simple and complicated, naive and wise, good and bad. We contain multitudes. All of that is in us and shouldn't just be boiled down to simple or not simple. This way of looking at those folks reminds me of Southerners saying, bless your heart. It's just a politely condescending way of being dismissive towards someone and getting away with it. And I don't want to single the South out for that because every part of the country has that, but the South is the most famous and well-known, so there we go. We know this is a metaphor, but it honestly doesn't seem to hold up to the real world. We don't just command people on the street to come eat with us, we invite them. At Brown Memorial, it's not like we had another soup kitchen competing with us. Oh no, that's the bad soup kitchen, come to the good one. And it's also worth noting, we probably don't slaughter our own animals or mix our own wine for our meals either. We've got the Finger Lakes for the wine mixing part. So we have this simple good over evil narrative, which as I said, doesn't feel that satisfying to me because we don't have the good or evil choice in our everyday lives, we have all of it in us at once. How helpful is this good or evil binary in a world like today, where everything seems and is complicated? In fact, we might say that wisdom comes from looking beyond that reductive binary into how we can reconcile both those sides of good and evil and everything in between. It's more of a spectrum than anything else, I would say. In that complication, I really resonated with something that British scholar John Golden Gay wrote in his commentary on Proverbs 9, which cuts through this noise in a good way. Quote, when we are contemplating action that might count as wrong, note might count as wrong, I I really love that way of looking at it because we might know it's wrong on some level, but there's also a justifiable reason we're doing it. So it's acknowledging the complications here. We are not inclined to check it with others first. So Lady Folly seeks to divert people into a relationship that will have the thrill that can accompany an affair, something that will initially seem life-giving but will ultimately have the odor of death. If we might invoke the singer Sia, 
folly will have us looking for cheap thrills. And I love this way of looking at things because it gets past these abstract questions of is it good or not, and instead asks, what's helpful to our world and what isn't? A good illustration for this actually happens in Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. I will use every excuse I can to use Star Wars in a sermon. But also, George Lucas himself admitted that Christian principles did influence it, along with Buddhist and Hindu principles. So when Luke Skywalker is training with Master Yoda on his back, and he's running around, at one point there's a stopping point, and he asks Yoda, is the dark side stronger? And Yoda says, no, 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 quicker, easier more seductive. And that's so interesting to me that the dark side is simply cheaper in Star Wars, not necessarily more malicious. That sometimes in both Star Wars and in our world, killing, violence is just an easier solution. We may acknowledge that killing or hurting someone or ignoring them isn't an ideal situation, but it's just easier for us that way. So with that, we get this contrast with dark side and folly and light side and wisdom. Dark side and folly is an easier path to follow that might hurt others but benefit us. Whereas the path of light slash wisdom is taking on that inconvenience to make someone else's life better. Proverbs tells us that wisdom is refusing to settle for easy answers that give us an excuse to write someone off. Wisdom is refusing to show anything less than love and grace with our neighbor. Doing the difficult things over the easy things, going out of our way to help and love our neighbor, to invite them to our table, to do the work of outreach to others. <laughs> refusing to wait for someone to invite us in, and instead inviting ourselves in, taking the initiative to maybe talk to someone before we pass judgment on them. Like I said before, this is hard. It sucks. It's truly work of the soul and the heart more than work of the body. And yet there are millions of people who are doing that work and have been doing that work of taking the hard road that helps others. And I'll give you the best example of that that I have ever encountered. Could not provide a better illustration than this from a Canadian politician and still a member of parliament named Jugmeet Singh, uh, who, whose picture I provided on a slide here. So you see Jugmeet Singh, who I'll call MP Singh, because he's a member of parliament, is a member of the Sikh religious tradition. Some of you pronounce Sikh, S-I-K-H. Sikhism is a monotheistic religion that worships one god, much like Christians, Jews, and Buddhists, um, that originated in India and Pakistan, uh, in the Punjab province, it's where most uh, Sikhs are, including that, and here in the United States. You've probably seen people, actually raise your hand if you've seen someone who uh, wears a beard and a, and a turban like this out at the grocery store. Yeah, I see, I see someone who's wearing this almost every time I go to Wegmans. Um, so this is, um, so just so, so this is like just as background. One of their temples called the Gurdwara, and they have free meals on their days of worship for everybody. It's in the Salina Clay area, which is a 15 minute drive from where we're sitting right now. So they have a temple here. This moment took place 250 miles up the road from here in Brampton, Ontario, which is a suburb of Toronto. It's one that I've thought about and tried to emulate my best for seven years. Now, Sikhism has a lot of hair growth, built. it's optional. Um, a lot of hair growth built into it. So there is something to be said for having a long beard, carrying a sword, um, are some of the, the traditions and not cutting your hair. And uh, some women have beards because of that too, because hair does grow out of women's faces sometimes. And this is in contrast to Muslim women who might cover up their whole hair with the hijab, or men who, um, in, uh, when they worship, might wear a skull cap called a kufi. And all of these are optional in the faith, but encouraged. So sometimes someone chooses to do that to be closer to their tradition for whatever reason, much like we might choose to tithe or offer as part of ours. 
I mention this distinction because since 9-11, Sikhs have been under attack from people who assume they're Muslim, despite being a very different religion. The same as happens to Christians and Jews and Hindus who have worn head coverings. And that's exactly what happened here. Now, I won't show the video because it's pretty intense and it's also a few minutes long, but I want to briefly describe it because it does have that hard path to wisdom. In September of 2017, MP Singh was giving a press conference there in Brampton, and in the middle of it, the woman wearing black yelled, stood up and started yelling at him with all this anti-Muslim rhetoric, reflecting the exact same post-9-11 bias. As she kept shouting and security came towards her, Singh stayed remarkably calm. As you can see with his body language in this, he's kind of relaxed and he's just talking like normal. Calmer than most of us would ever be under the same circumstance. He responded to her fever-pitched ranting with a calm, cool, and simple message to the crowd. Let's show people how we would treat someone with love. Then he turned to the woman as she was struggling against security to tell her, we welcome you, we love you, we support you, we believe in your rights. As you can imagine, this moment went viral. A moment of standing up to impatient hate with patient love and forgiveness, which is a huge part of the Sikh religion. The thing that stuck with me, however, is a public statement that Jagmeet Singh put up shortly after, which is on the PowerPoint right now. And I'll read it out for you right now. Many people have commented that I could have just said that I'm not Muslim. In fact, many have clarified that I'm actually sick. While I'm proud of who I am, I purposely didn't go down that road because it suggests their hate would be okay if I was Muslim. Singh saw this hate for what it truly was, an easy way to hate others and remain ignorant. He could have bought into the easy path of folly, distancing himself from Muslims. Instead, he bought into the hard path of wisdom, of standing with them against hatred. And I'll admit, I wouldn't have had that patience in the same situation. As much as I believe I am that per I would want to be that person, I just know myself well enough to know I wouldn't have. I try to love everybody, but I probably would have gotten mad in return, as I know many of us would, and we'd have every right to be. I aspire to have as much wisdom in my pinky finger as Jugmeet Singh had in his whole body in that moment. And just admitting that is the first step. God, I know where I want to be, and I'm not there yet. Help me get there. That's how we follow God's wisdom, through being patient with others, while also acting up against hate and discrimination. We must allow our hearts to break for others and then put in the work to help them. So when we close this service by singing the hymn, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, that is exactly what we're called to do, to love our neighbors with our whole hearts, knowing our minds and our bodies will follow, taking on a temporary inconvenience or discomfort to help others, going out of our way to help. May we show that wisdom, that thirst to grow, this day and forevermore. Amen. If you are here with us in the <clears throat> sanctuary this morning, your offerings can be left in the basket in the narthex. And if you are viewing us from home, they can be mailed to 823 Franklin Park Drive, East Syracuse, 13057. I would also like to mention that for the special collection um, for the folks uh, impacted from the severe weather, 
the separate basket out there. If you put cash in there and you would like it to be reflected in your year-end donations to the church, please put your cash in one of the envelopes out there with your name. Our dedication. Lord, may we seek your wisdom, may we seek your will, may we seek to serve others, may we seek our best selves in everything that we do, as we do better for you each and every day. Amen. And now we are in our time of joys and concerns where someone will take a microphone to you and you can express a joy or concern, and then we will pray for you um, in the prayers of the people. And so just know that what you share here will be shared in love. I'm gonna start uh, with a few things this morning. Uh, first of all, um, I've been informed that Eddie Dunn, uh, who is still a member of our church, he and his family moved to South Carolina a couple years ago, has been in the hospital for a couple of days. Uh, that's all the information I have right now. <clears throat> Judy Walters is now at the cross or the crossings, the, the cottages in Cicero. Um, not sure how long she may be there or whether she will be going back to uh, her home in uh, Liverpool. In regards to the Brown Memorial that we did serving last week. Um, both Columer and our church made up some takeout containers for folks who are shut-ins, don't get to church very often. And I will say that of the folks that received them, that every one of them said to me, I really miss coming to church and will come when I can. And Henry and Noreen were able to get here this morning although we realize that it's, it's, it's a chore, we certainly are glad that you made it here. Anyone else have any announcements that they wish to share, joys or concerns? We have a joy. Yeah, my daughter, Aline, and her husband, Sean, welcomed Ian Patrick Lucking into the world yesterday morning. Eight pounds, four ounces. Woo! Um, just prayers from my brother-in-law who's been going through some heart issues and don't know where it's gonna go from there. He's a leaky mitral valve and they don't know because of his age how they're gonna fix it, but they're working on it. So pray for him and his name is Michael. Yeah, my husband's sister um, has been diagnosed with temporal arteritis. It's an autoimmune disease, and she's lost the vision in one eye irreparably and is now um, in the hospital getting massive doses of a steroid to try to save the vision in her other eye. So her name is Marjorie, and we would appreciate prayers that the steroids will work and that she, she can adjust to this new reality in her life. Also, a joy and a little scary, my 
grandson Colin is returning to college in Cincinnati this week, and he's driving himself. He's got a car, his own car, so he'll be, as a sophomore, taking himself back to college this year. So prayers for a safe trip and a happy sophomore year of college. Amen. I'd like to ask for continued prayers for Roxanne. Um, she's healthy, um, but she's pretty nonverbal at the nursing home. But the other day, one of the aides said that she said a complete sentence to her, which is very unusual. She hasn't spoken that much in a year. So maybe there's some hope. Amen. That's great news. As you know, I have talked about my cousin Don that went through cancer surgery and everything. He is in Baldinsville right now in rehab, OTPT, and just received news that he is doing so well that Monday they're having a reevaluation on him and if possible, he could be going home. Amen. It's also good news. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Anybody else? That is a full lid. And I hope you know that in the good and in the bad and in the in-between, we are with you. So let us take these concerns, these joys, and everything to God. Lord, you know what is in our hearts. You know the pain that is there, the joy that is there. You know that all of us are carrying something within us that weighs us down, that another person wouldn't carry well. May we have the grace with ourselves, the love with ourselves, to see that we're doing okay, that we are hanging in there in you, and to also accept when things aren't so good. We pray for those folks who were affected by severe weather this week that they adjust to their new reality and that hopefully their houses can get rebuilt soon as we help them with that. We pray for the folks who are discerning membership here, whether this is a congregation they want to be part of long term. And as much as we want that to be a yes, we also know that God guides them in whatever is ahead. We pray for our friend in South Carolina, Eddie Dunn, who is in the hospital. May you walk with him, Lord. May you pick him up. May he know that our arms are wrapped around him even after he's moved away. We pray for Judy Walters as she is left, as she's in the cottages in Cicero, doesn't know when she go, she'll go home to Liverpool. May you continue to be with her, Lord, in whatever is next, to know that whatever is surrounding her, we got her in the palm of our hands. We pray for Michael and his heart issues, because the diagnosis is one of the most difficult parts, figuring out what is wrong with somebody. And so we pray that God continues to be there through whatever comes next. Even if he doesn't feel you there, know you're there, may he feel that you are there, Lord. We pray for Marjorie and her temporal arteritis, for steroids in her other eye, we pray that that eye might be saved and that she might adjust to whatever happens. May she take the paths of love, of patience with herself, of grace with herself, because any one of us would have trouble adjusting to this new thing. And we pray for her strength and love and adjustment in that. And we pray for Roxanne as she is healthy and has said a complete sentence, and for Greg as he takes care of her too. We pray that this beloved saint of the church might feel our arms around her, that she might feel so much love with her, that she might feel our prayers, our thoughts, our outreach to her. And in the same way as the concerns, Lord, we lift up these joys, these great things we see in our world. We lift up the birthdays this week of Suzanne Green on August 19th, of Luke Sweeney on August 20th, John Stukes on August 24th. May their lives feel appreciated and loved and celebrated 
as they are your children. And we are so grateful this morning, Lord, for Don's post-cancer rehab and this reevaluation on Monday. We pray that he gets to go home soon, but even if he doesn't, that you continue to guide him through whatever is ahead. May he feel so loved and so surrounded. We, pray, we give thanks that we can take leftovers to shut-ins, to feel them here with us, whether they're here or not. We give thanks that Henry and Noreen were able to come today. But we also pray for those who weren't able to be here, that, that uh, they know that we feel their presence here with us, Lord, that we know that they are here among us. They don't have to be here for us to feel their love, their presence, their ways of lifting up this congregation. We also lift up Elaine and John as they welcome baby Ian. We pray that he may live a healthy life, that he may know your love, and that he may feel the people who are praying for him from far away. We pray for Colin as he goes back to college in Cincinnati for sophomore year as he becomes a better man, a better person who knows how he wants to help the world and love the world. And we pray for all returning students in the same way. And we are also thankful for the presence of visitors, of Aaron and Amy, among so many young people who have decided to visit here recently, including the one who's talking right now, that they may find a community here or somewhere else and know that we welcome them so much for however long they're here. And now let us take time, even though we have so many of these prayers, there are always more to give, so let us lift up those prayers now. Lord, we lift up these prayers and so many more that are in our hearts, saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us sing together our final hymn, number 402. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, knowing that we hold this desire to be God's children in our hearts. Let us have our intentions match our actions.
Well, that felt very choral. I was so happy to hear people singing in parts and singing different things, and I'm always happy to hear that, and as I'm sure uh, Christy is too. <laughs> and now the benediction, because this song plays perfectly into um, our message today. Um, I think it just kind of says it perfectly, that I want to be a Christian in my heart, acknowledging that we're here, God wants us to be here, and we're asking God to help us make up the difference. Reminds me of one of my favorite quotes about faith from Thomas Merton, who was a great 20th century uh, mystic. Lord, I don't know how to please you, but I think the fact I want to please you pleases you. And so, friends, as we go forward, let us remember the wisdom of the harder path. Let us go out of our way to serve others, to let them know they are loved, and let us wisely share God's love with others, opening our hearts to Christ, allowing true love and vulnerability into our whole hearts. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and amen. Thank you.